there so you don't have to see my face um, for a long time. So thank you for our annual sponsors, UZ Business School, uh, AWS and Stratus, who's been a significant partner uh, for a long time and some from recently, and also others called Ridiculous Digital, who's been helping us with website and stuff and automation, integration work, site host, Crescent Consulting. Thank you for being supporting what we do. And uh, we are here for the, so the next, is it the next? Oh, it's February. Great. So the next uh, next monthly event we have, it's a special one because we are going to have a book um, a book launch in terms of technology. And this is being done at Turanga TSB room, which is one of the biggest room. And it's free for members. And uh, Ben Reed, who is a very favorite, fan favorite of Canterbury Christchurch, um, is, uh, is going to present. He's been a chair of Canterbury Tech. He's also... Uh, the founding executive member of AA Forum, uh, the AA Think Tank and um, uh, group currently working. And he's been part of consulting part of this. So he's going to be presenting in monthly when it's already sold out 50%. It's the three hours of today. So make sure you get your tickets um, right today as soon as possible. Otherwise, you're going to miss out. Uh, we and for non members, it's $30, and we're going for the schedule like of stuff. So, Tech Fest. So, we had Tech Week run every year, and we Louisa introduced like you know, how we're going to convert Tech Week into a, a focused Tech Fest, it is which is owned by Canterbury Tech. And we have the five day um, plan right over here. The proposed schedule and structure, we're working on it currently. We have the future of health, big ideas for the second second day, and woven cultures and digitech, and future of sustainability and climate, and future of business. So, last year we had the first kind of Canterbury Christchurch hub, and it was a massive hit. And the entire day was about the entire week, we had about thousand footfalls uh, in those five days, which is significantly a little higher than the tech summit that we run um, annually. So make sure you sign up for one of this if it's if it's calling out to you. And we are also doing the woven uh, woven cultures and digital with the Tiati Matiho and Tangata Moana Trust and Crashed NZ. Um, the tech fest falls alongside the time same time as Tech Week. Um, which should be May. I should know that. Um, so Tech Week 2024, uh, it's from 20 to 26 May. Uh, so you can be part of uh, that. That is entirely focused on Christchurch and we will have a particular hub where you can just come in and do this. So this is going to be great this year because this is more refined, more defined and more um, exciting uh, kind of events and themes that is coming up this year. Great. And if you know someone who is going to be a great keynote speaker or like, you know, a great person who can be part of this, please, please make sure you send it our way. Um, like, you know, you can find the uh, info at Canterbury Tech NZ to send it. And you can also sign up to our newsletter where you can get to see uh, all the events and things for um, the, uh, like, you know, for the entire session. So thank you, Jen, for updating me with the key information from backend. So we have Jit, introducing J Jit. So he has been part of, uh, he's, a C, he's a CEO of uh, Paid Now, CEO and co-founder of Paid Now. I think he's had a career over 16 years and he's worked in the aviation industry, which we're gonna, and he's right now moved um, to into a founder and director of blockchain industry. Uh, and he has contributed as a developer, miner, and day trader before jumping onto this new um, uh, era of blockchain and digital payment system, which I'm, which we're going to talk about more of the, the journey that he had and some of the questions um, that we uh, get to find. And also, based on his presentation, we can also ask him questions. So if if you find out any question, just make sure you post it in the message in the chat for me to pick up. And 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 I can curate it to Jit and get the right answers for you all. But introducing Jit, I'm gonna pass it on to you. Welcome in. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just start sharing my screen over here. Um, yeah, welcome everyone to this uh, talk about how we can use cryptocurrency, one of its many uses, to basically revolutionize cross-border money transfer or cross-border remittance, as it were. So before we start, uh, let's acknowledge that there's different levels of people understanding blockchain. So let's talk about the basics first. Uh, if we strip away all the hype, all the complexity, blockchains are, at its very core, digital ledgers, basically a way to store transactions. 
And each transaction is cryptographically tied or a fancy of just saying mathematical complex algorithms basically tie each transaction to the previous transaction. Now, if you combine with this with the fact that transactions are processed in batches, often called blocks, which are then linked together in a change, you start to understand why this whole field is called cryptocurrency or blockchain technology. The second most important fact to understand is that this ledger is shared across the world and it is synced, meaning everyone has access to the same ledger and it is virtually impossible to cheat the system or add falsified data to it. This is why cryptocurrencies can function without a central governing authority like a bank, yet still maintain that level of trust with its users. Now, let's have a look at what, what, how, how it works when you're trying to send money traditionally across borders. A task that for many of us has been fraught with frustration and unnecessary complexity. This isn't just about convenience. It's about having a real impact on people's lives and businesses. Firstly, consider the high fees involved. Each international transfer involves a series of intermediaries, each of them taking their slice of the pie because they are businesses looking to make a profit. These aren't just flat fees. They often include a markup on the exchange rate. And this is something that can significantly increase the cost of sending money abroad. Then there are the waiting times. In an age where we can communicate instantly across the globe, it's baffling that moving money from one country to another can still take several days. And this delay isn't just about uh, being inconvenient. It can be costly, affecting cash flow for businesses and delaying financial support for families in need. Furthermore, the cumbersome legal requirements and paperwork add another layer of complexity. Compliance with anti-money laundering laws or AML or know your customer regulations, what we call KYC, is essential. But the way these are implemented can often be opaque and varied from one institution to another. This inconsistency can lead to further delays and even transactions being unexpectedly blocked or canceled or reversed. We've all experienced that where the bank will simply refuse to honor your transaction. And in fact, just today, before this meeting, I've heard another story of someone who was trying to buy a plane ticket somewhere and the bank would simply not process their transaction because that country happens to be on a sanction list with America. That is something that simply should not happen. Now, we as a business, we've experienced this firsthand. We are a cryptocurrency exchange. Our business is, it's a crucial part of our business to move money abroad. Now we needed to mo move funds from Australia to New Zealand. And you would think that with our countries being linked together, this would be a very easy process. But turns out, it wasn't that easy. We evaluated the cost and time it would take through a traditional bank transfer by doing one. And we found it was absurdly more efficient, both in terms of time and money, to physically fly to Australia, withdraw the cash in person at a bank and fly back the same day. The cost of a plane ticket was cheaper. Albeit I was privy to discounted travel rates and may not appeal to everyone. Uh, but the fact is I was able to leave in the morning visit an ATM, withdraw $9,500 in cash and fly back the same day. And we had money in our bank account the same day versus we logged into our ANZ bank account and started the transaction. And it took over four days before those funds were in our account. And the cost, the cost was remarkably similar. You have exchange rate differences, the fees to make the transaction. The experience was a stark revelation about the inefficiency and costliness of our current financial system. It's a vivid example of how outdated and disconnected from modern technology, our bank, uh, modern technological capabilities, our banking infrastructure really is. And this, this situation isn't just a minor inconvenience. It's a barrier for commerce and personal finance management. I would consider us a small business and it really affects other small businesses they rely on timely payments to keep operations running smoothly, families sending remittances overseas, or freelancers working for international clients, or just anyone who's looking to move money across borders. But then we got to thinking about it. Why in our age should 
transferring money be any more difficult than sending an email? Why do we accept this as the status quo or the way things are? This dissatisfaction should be what drives the search for better solutions. And in our opinion, that's what blockchain technology promises to offer. As we delve deeper into how blockchain can address these challenges, keep in mind the contrast between the old and the new, the traditional and the innovative, and what I've just explained, our personal experience and how blockchain technology is not just a leap in technology, but a shift in how we think about and manage our financial interactions across the globe. So when we were doing this transfer, this is very personal, so please keep that in mind. I'll just preface this by saying this is something I experienced firsthand. I had never moved funds from Australia to New Zealand or before at all. So both of these bank accounts were owned by a company. We owned these accounts. We had KYC, we had AML, we had full internet access to these accounts. So before we could even transfer the funds, there was a whole list of security requirements, including downloading separate apps for the banks that we needed to download from just to enable two-factor authentication, just to get started with enabling international transfers, then doing additional what they call ECDD, enhanced customer due diligence to lift the limits. That sounds like the worst part, but then it gets worse. I don't have to explain to people how hard it is that the first time you log into a bank account and you're sending money to someone else's bank account, that anxiety of, am I entering the right numbers? Am I getting all the information that I have done correctly? Because if I send this money to someone else's bank account, it's essentially gone. Then make matters worse was Australia uses the BSB and SWIFT code number system that New Zealand just doesn't use. So now I have to go out and find these. And then I had to trust that the website that I had gotten this from were valid. Now, luckily we use Kiwi Bank, so we were able to find these on the official Kiwi Bank website. But if you didn't know where to look, it's additional delays while you go out and try and find these details. The ordeal, however, was not over. After navigating through multiple pages of entering details, ticking check boxes, I initiated the transfer. And then you find out the other problem in the system is that you just get a nice page that says, your transfer is now complete. It may take up to two to five business days for that money to show up in the recipient bank account. This is key. These are business days. So if I started this on a Thursday, I would not see the money in my target bank account, possibly by next Thursday or Wednesday. The, the approximate cost for us was about $100 in fees to transfer is about $350 lost in the exchange rate. But imagine the money has already been taken out from your source bank account and it's not available in your destination bank account. For us, that's like $10,000 that we now no longer have access to, to pay our staff, to pay our bills, to do anything with. Now let's compare that to you using uh, what we use now. After, after that ordeal, we immediately switched over to a better system. We now use what we call stable coins. Now, uh, we, we, we could go into the whole stable coin um, details, but and in fact, our friends at Easy Crypto, they've launched a new stable coin called NZDD, which is pegged to the New Zealand dollar, which is amazing. But we use USDT for the moment, which is pegged to the United States dollar. You can, you can finish a transaction in less than five minutes and with a cost of less than five cents NZD. And in fact, most transactions cost less than two cents NZD. You can scan a QR code to pre-fill the wallet address and that's all you leave. Uh, that's all you need. The funds will leave your Australian wallet and arrive in your NZ wallet in seconds. And that is not an exaggeration. You can choose to use other blockchains. We use uh, the Polygon network. You can use Ethereum, in which case your fees are slightly higher. Um, and these are gas fees, mind you. This is not the blockchain charging you fees. These are basically paid to miners, et cetera, for the cost of running the network. But even if it's at $16, it's a far cry from any traditional finance platform. And the key to this process is this process can handle 24 seven. So my partner in Australia, he can get home from a long day's work, 
he can log into his wallet at 9 p.m. at night and send the money and I will have it instantly available to us. Now, I would be amiss if I didn't mention at this point that this is where the largest hurdle for using cryptocurrency comes in for cross-border payments. And that is, at the end of this process, you have cryptocurrency in your account, not cash. You will need an off-ramp. This is where cryptocurrency exchanges like Pay It Now or our friends Easy Crypto, crypto brokers uh, like Easy Crypto come in. You would need to convert that crypto to cash and it still shows up in your bank account. The delay is much lower. You're, you're looking at two to three hours and you have funds in your bank account. However, if you're, a, if you're happy keeping those funds in crypto for the eventuality that you'll move it back to New Zealand or back to Australia or any other country, then your transaction is essentially complete. So this is where we, we're looking at blockchain technology far outstripping, far outpacing conventional technology. Now, with that in mind, we also have to look at the elephant in the room, which is as we embrace the investment advancements brought by blockchain technology, it's crucial to address the regulatory landscape that governs these transactions. Ensuring safe, compliant transfers is not just about leveraging the new technology. It's about aligning with the legal frameworks that safeguard the financial system. This alignment requires capable navigation, understanding, and cooperation with the regulatory bodies worldwide. Cryptocurrency exchanges and brokers, they play a pivotal role in this ecosystem. These platforms act as bridges between the traditional finance world and the emerging realm of digital currencies. They are not just marketplaces for buying, selling, or holding cryptocurrencies. They are the gatekeepers of legal compliance in the digital finance space. One of the key regulatory requirements that exchanges help fulfill involves the KYC, or Know Your Customer Requirement, and the anti-money laundering AML protocols. These are designed to verify the identity of individuals engaging in financial transactions, ensuring businesses know who their customers are. And the AML regulations are aimed at preventing transfer of funds that could be associated with criminal activity. It's a complex space involving, uh, sorry, it's a complex evolving space with different countries and regions developing their own rules and guidelines for digital currencies and blockchain technology. This creates a challenge for exchanges and users alike, requiring constant vigilance and adaption to remain compliant around, around jurisdictions. Now, the future of finance is not just approaching, it has arrived and it is 100% powered by blockchain technology, in our opinion. We stand at the precipice of financial revolution, one that promises to redefine our understanding and handling of money in an increasingly interconnected world. The momentum behind blockchain is not merely about its current application, but significantly about its vast untapped potential to streamline and enhance the financial services on a global scale. I, I, that, that's about the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to take some questions. Seku? No, we can. Um, we've got a few questions. I'll I'll take over. I don't know what he's doing at the moment. Yes. Um, Stephanie asked an ethical question. So the blockchain can't ban or restrict Putin or other tyrants of their money harvest from blood sweet shops, blood sweat shops. Correct. Um, that is a very interesting and ethical question. And here's the thing. With blockchain technology, one of the key factors is that there are no central governing bodies. Now, what that means is everyone is in control of their own funds. There are no banks. So just like I said, a bank can stop you from spending your funds. But with a blockchain, you are essentially your own bank. So no one can stop you from spending that crypto. Now, yes, there are places that you can get stopped. And one of them is when you convert that crypto back into fiat. So no, while we cannot uh, stop Putin from spending his ill-gotten gains, he is restricted to only people who accept crypto in return. 
while there is an ever-growing number of people to do that, it is a small number of people to do that. Um, okay, let's look at, is it Pakiki Security? Would there be tax implications on receiving off-ramping payments? That, that's a very, very good question. So one thing to note is cryptocurrency is deemed at its current point in time a digital asset. So the IRD in its current form is treating it as a asset. So you would only pay for capital gains. What we're suggesting is the use of stable points for immediate international transfers. And as such, you are not making any gains on that currency. So you would not be liable for any tax. Again, this is not financial advice, but you would not be liable for any taxes on those because you're not essentially making any gains on it. Someone's paid you a thousand NZD in Australia and you receive a thousand NZD here. You haven't made a gain on it. Right. Uh, I'm back. I'm just also curious in terms of the the, the New Zealand stable coin, like mm -hmm. because you mentioned with the stable coin as such, like can you explain what that could be and like why is it important to New Zealand public? Mm -hmm. that, excellent. So stable coins are traditionally pegged to the respective dollar. So USDT is the United States dollar issued by a company called Tether. Mm -hmm. Easy Crypto have issued what they call NZDD or New Zealand dollar backed stable, uh, stable coin. What this means is it doesn't matter how poorly or well crypto does. You can always take one NZD to Easy Crypto and they will give you one dollar in return. It's the same for Tether. One USDT will always be worth one US dollar. So what it does is it basically shields you from any volatility in the crypto space. And the same applies for foreign exchange fees. If you wanted to truly avoid any foreign exchange fees or any rate fluctuations at all, you mm -hmm. could have people in Australia buy 1,000 NZD, send it to you, and you would have 1,000 NZD. There is no exchange rate fluctuation at all. Right. And and also like connecting with the same thing, Paul Svetahema asked, how hard is it to convert from crypto to fiat? Like you know, using many of the many of the stable coins or your services as such, and, and do you charge a fee for that? Right. So right now in New Zealand, it is very easy to convert from crypto to fiat using um, any provider. We have the Paid Now Network, which we are. We are an exchange based out of Christchurch, and you can literally just log into your app. If you've got a bank account connected, you can just click withdraw to bank and the crypto will be in your bank account. Mm -hmm. Easy Crypto is also one of the biggest exchanges or crypto brokers in New Zealand. And they provide the exact same service where you can send them crypto and they will cash up to your bank account. So it is a very simple process. And like I said, it takes the, the delay you would not believe is not the exchange itself, but the time it takes the banks to process the payment to your bank account. So when I say it takes about two to three hours, Mm -hmm. Your exchange is actually converted pretty quickly. The delay is because money has to leave our bank account and go to your bank account. And that's where the delay is, the two to three right, hours. Yeah. The processing turret, it just takes a lot of time Correct. To, in the fast pace world. And that's a huge barrier for many of the business and transactions as such. I had a question towards it. If I was a retailer, what is the barriers to accept crypto as a payment option? Like, you know, and like, you know, hardware, software, and how accessible uh, uh, is is you guys are like, you know, around the same time we're making it? I, I don't want to sound like I'm shilling our company here, but that is what we do as a company and is we enable merchants to accept cryptocurrency as a form of contactless payment with no cost to the merchant, meaning there's no surcharge to the merchant. And so this, the merchant doesn't have to pass the surcharge to the user. Mm -hmm. So the barrier for entry is literally signing up for, with us printing mm -hmm. a QR code and displaying it in your store. You don't need right. any special hardware. It's uh, we've, lo we've looked at other payment providers like we have your Alipay, your WeChat Pay. Uh, mm -hmm. a, lot of QR, a lot of payments uh, providers are moving to QR-based payments rather than using traditional terminals for payment where you can scan to pay and the merchant can check yeah. on the app or something. So that's all you need to accept crypto payments here in New Zealand now is just sign up. 
yeah, get a QR code and get started. Fantastic. Because you mentioned about the charges as like, you know, it's very, very nil or no charges. Like, can I, can you explain the on and off ramp ch exchanges that Alex OP is asking? Right. So very simple. Let's say a user walks into your store and wants to pay you a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. In a traditional Visa card or MasterCard transaction, the merchant would be subject to Visa or MasterCard fees and would pass that surcharge to the user. Let's say two or three dollars worth. So the user ends up paying $102, the merchant gets $100. Or the merchant has to swallow that fee and they get $97. With oh, okay. crypto payments, the user walks into the store, you charge mm -hmm. them $100. Now they can pay with whatever cryptocurrency they want. They can pay with Bitcoin, Ethereum, this, this, this lots. And it's a whole different discussion altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the merchant doesn't have to care. Just like accepting credit card payments, yeah. merchants will receive cash in their bank account the same day. And like I said, there's no fee to them. If they were paid $100, they get $100 in their bank account. Right. Okay. Instantly. And would, do you think there will be tax implication on receiving these payments at all? Like, you know, how does the government keep track of it? Pakiki security is kind of interested in this question. Yeah. So uh, uh, I will I will just correct one, one small thing is that it's not instant. The merchant gets paid out every day. So they get paid out every, every day. Um, okay. In terms of tax implications, Accepting crypto with uh, with the new system we're coming with, as a merchant, you are not accepting crypto. You are literally getting paid the same as you would be getting paid in MasterCard or Visa card. You are getting paid in NZ dollars. So if someone pays you $100 worth of Bitcoin, they're not paying you Bitcoin. They're paying you in NZD. We take care of all the complexities. And right. as a merchant, you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. We're lit here. But how does it change in terms of traditional system? Do, doesn't everyone get paid? Like, you know, I'm just acting as a, a like in a newcomer into this entire thing. Doesn't everyone gets paid at the end of the day or week? What kind of difference is it making for the, like, you know, retailer of SAG? So the the users, they, they pay with crypto. The merchants mm -hmm. get paid in NZD. When they sign up with us, they obviously join up. They give, up, give us their bank details, just like you would with Wincave or any other payment provider. And then every evening or every night, we have a system that basically pays them NZ, NZD on what they were paid, what they made in the day. Just it, basically exactly how a credit card system operates, only we have crypto in, instead of a credit card operation. Right, okay, that's good. So in terms of like anti-money laundering and uh, um, and counter countering financing of terrorism of source, how do you verify the source of funds? Like, you know, for transferring, like 10,000 New Zealand dollars or anything that is about the thing. Mark is keen on this. Right. So as you could, as you can probably tell, because we have our own, uh, what we call the PIN network, where all these transactions take place, users have to go through um, basic KYC when we start. AMA, mm -hmm. uh, we do a PEP check. We do a sanctions checks. There's a lot of procedures that users have to sign up before they can actually start utilizing the system. So right. all of these are done prior to the user using this. Okay, is so, is the data is is the data that you think of is is currently stayed in every organization's like um a database like you know is that how it yeah uh, like as a as a is it a part of an obligation to show it to the the banks or anything do you think we we have very close ties with uh, the DIA which we work with very closely as part of our AML compliance manual and yes we work with third party providers who can compile this data and if we are required to we can share this with whoever has an interest assuming that it you know there there is a need to be shared so yes we are we do have the capability to to do that okay, right. and and sam from bridgeshare is kind of keen on like you know what is a new zealand based bank that you operate with on the the fiat side like you know that is comfortable with your operations in the space like you know is there any particular banks that is really driving this and, and oh. taking board and how was the process for you as a business uh, to deal with One, 100% for anyone who wants to listen on this call Kiwi Bank have just been amazing. So Kiwi Bank right. is who we work with. And I'll tell you for a fact right now, no other bank in New Zealand will want to work with anything related with cryptocurrency at yeah. all. Yeah, Kiwi right. Bank is the only one. And this is something that's an ongoing struggle for new businesses and something that is stifling growth in this industry. Yes, right. I realize that uh, cryptocurrency as a whole has, have, has had to deal with issues in terms of people using it for nefarious purposes. But at the same time, mm -hmm. so has fiat. If you compare how much uh, negativity goes to the fiat system and the crypto system, you'll, you'll see that the fiat system, traditional finance system has 
far more scams, but crypto mm. gets a bad name. So unfortunately, banks do not want to deal with crypto businesses, but Kiwi Bank has been the best. So I recommend anyone who wants to look into that, go with Kiwi Bank. They're the best so far. Fantastic. Um, and there's also like, you know, I think uh, Mitchell, I don't know if the question is still relevant. What is the state of PIN network and are there any future developments planned for PIN? Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. like something so, that is like, free to yeah. capture. Some so so the, the PIN network is our proprietary network, which operates as a layer two to basically cross the bridge between the various blockchains and make transactions easier. So mm -hmm. that's this way end users who want to use crypto for the first time don't right. have to deal with the complexity. They don't have to understand how all the technology works. We act as a layer above to make it easy for you, basically. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about how everything works. Don't have to worry about security. We'll handle all that so you can actually use cryptocurrency for the first time and get comfortable with it. At the same time, when you're ready to take that next journey, we make it easy for you to leave and be the master of your own money, so, so to speak with use, utilizing cryptocurrency as well. Yeah, that's fair. And as a customer, like, can a, can a customer still make a payment for from any decentralized wallets or do they require the PIN app to interact with businesses? Uh, right. I, I will, uh, uh, this ties in with the previous question. Yeah. Right now, you do need the PIN network app, but okay, very, yeah. so, very, very soon, we are coming up with a way where anyone can walk up to a decentralized, with a decentralized wallet, have your MetaMask, have your trust, trust wallet, your Exodus wallet, whatever, and still make a payment. So that is something that is on the roadmap and it'll be coming out very, very soon. Fantastic. And and generally speaking, like, you know, I think what are the kind of risks you as a company, like, you know, is taking in, in kind of doing many of this? Like, you know, what is the kind of risk and what are the kind of steps that you're trying to protect your customers and protect the system and making sure that this 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 new technology is being um, uh, trustworthy amongst the companies and businesses and individuals of sorts? Well. One of the biggest, uh, the most simple way to answer this is security in terms of protecting users' funds. Unlike mm -hmm. a lot of uh, uh, other companies, we mm -hmm. actually manage our own, all, all the wallets ourselves, private keys ourselves. So we have to constantly keep a, keep a lookout for security vulnerabilities. And it's a cat and mouse game. You put one step in, someone was trying to do, put another step in. Mm -hmm. That's the simplest one. But one thing we've found, which is more concerning, is the amount of people who are scamming users in New Zealand out of their bank details. We've, we've just had the scare in less than three weeks ago. People mm -hmm. actually give up their bank details for other users who then use this to buy cryptocurrency and just disappear with your money. So that is not just a, that's a security concern for us, but it's more to do with the banks because if a bank can not protect a user's funds from being loaded into a crypto platform, how are we supposed to stop it? And in fact, when I called up, I called up two different banks and talked to two different fraud analysts. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, we can't really do anything because the user gave them the bank details. I called up the police department and they're like, we can't do anything until the person who was robbed makes the complaint. Because mm -hmm. they didn't even know they had been robbed. And this isn't a small amount. It's something like four or $5,000. And right. so that it's security, but at the same time, it's not because it's simply education. And unfortunately, it's, it's a two-part system. Yes, people use crypto for this, but the crux of it is you're really socially engineering people and getting access to the bank accounts. That's fair. And even in terms of like um, the other question that I had was, uh, damn it, I forgot. Anyway, um, oh no, I had a really good, interesting question. Um, uh, but... Okay, so in terms of like Alex Ope, I'll go back to the question, like how do you make any money if there's no fees? Like, you know, uh, like what is your sustainability model? Right, so first you have to realize, and I, I promise I'll answer this question, but I'll make, I'll, I'll ask a different question in return. Sorry right? if I missed it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Visa and MasterCard, they charge you, let's say in New Zealand anyway, two to 3% per transaction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It doesn't cost them that much to process the transaction. All of the other stuff in between, you have your chargeback protection, your insurance, all of that. But why does it cost you 3% to make a $1 transaction and 3% to make a $10,000 transaction? Mm. Right? So mm. our company motto is very simple. And we've said it in multiple places. If it doesn't cost something, if it doesn't cost us, it should cost the user. So adding new transactions to our PIN network, it doesn't cost us anything fractions upon fractions of a penny. 
Now, right. having said that, we do, as a, like a business, need to make a profit, and we make profit on the exchange and on the what we call spread. That is the buying and selling rates of cryptocurrency. That is where we make our money. Right. Okay. That may, that kind of makes sense. And um, I'm going to take the last set of questions, like one or two maximum, and, and we'll be done with it. Um, so you mentioned about like the instant, like, you know, the, the anxiety in terms of like, you know, sending to the bank account. I don't know if you yeah. missed the answer or something. You said, oh, it's going to be always anxious. Like, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. But what are the yeah. steps you can do in this? Like, you know, is there a way to take back that you have sent back? Like, I yeah. don't know. I, yeah. This is, this is where it, it's it's brilliant for the merchants. All cryptocurrency transactions are final, meaning you can't charge someone back. And this is huge because chargeback is one of the biggest costs for loss for users. However, this is something crypto users do regularly that regular users possibly don't, is that most people who use decentralized finance, what they call, they'll send a small transaction through to test and make sure that they got the right address, and then they'll send their main funds. However, uh, with, with a system like ours, which is a centralized exchange platform, there is zero chance of you losing the funds unless you specifically send to the wrong address, which is very rare because most of the time you're scanning a QR code to pre-fill the address anyway. You're not sitting there typing the address. 90% of the time, you'll just be scanning a QR code and that'll pre-fill the address for you. Yeah. What about be... online? Like, I don't think you're going to use the QR code online. Like, and if you're booking flights or something online. Right. So... Yeah. It, in those scenarios, right, in those scenarios, they'll give you an address that you just, just copy and paste. Now, yes, if you copy and paste the wrong address, anything, in, yeah. anything can happen, but yes. Happen. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and I have one kind of ethical question from Stephanie. So the blockchain can't ban or restrict kind of uh, political to restrict to, like, you know. Oh, we, we, we answered that already. We answered that. Yeah, we answered that already. Thank <laughs> thank you, thank you, that's great. Yeah. And um, possibly, I think to um, uh, the other question that I had was like, you know, uh, in terms of personal to this, because we don't have much questions. So aviation flight, like, you know, you were part of the yeah. aviation yeah. first officer in like, you know, two different aviation yes. in Logica. What what was the journey towards the crypto and like, you know? Uh, so, and yeah, so very briefly, me and Craig Duffield, the other co-founder, we were flying in PG Airways, where I spent most of my career, over 10 years flying, where we flew, uh, I flew ATRs, and then I moved on to flying 737s, which is where I met Craig. Yeah. Um, on a flight to Hawaii, we had what we call a depressurization. It's where all the oxygen was, because all the air was basically leaking out of plane. And yeah. we had to put on our masks and dive down to 10,000 feet. It was amazing. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't know, amazing is the word that I'd use, but sure. Yeah. <laughs> It, it, it was an experience. So in that incident, I unfortunately injured a very crucial part of the balance mechanism in my inner ear. And mm -hmm. since then, I've been trying to get back into flying. Lucky I had a programming background that I could fall back onto. So while I was in flying school, et cetera, I was just learning programming on the side. And it seemed a nat natural progression just into going to web development. And from web development, when Ethereum was taken off to smart contracts, and from there, Oh, we, when we started using cryptocurrency, we, we could see that there was a need for payments and we could see a need for what we what we developed, basically, mm -hmm. a, a way to spend cryptocurrency and ma make it easier. Because I remember navigating those waters back in like 2014, 2015, 2016. It wasn't easy. Local Bitcoins was a thing. But apart from that, you couldn't really do anything. So this is where we came up with, this is what we're going to do. In 2019, we were doing... Some other things we're doing, virtual reality training devices, a lot of things, and then boom, pandemic hit and suddenly stuck in our house. Hey, let's do something in crypto payments. And then Ruben from the Aussie Bush is like, I'll take you in my store. And then from that, things just exploded. But that was the general journey from being a, a pilot, a first officer in PGOAs to uh, being a, a payments uh, gateway in cryptocurrency. How many people do you have in your team currently? Is it so we have approximately, we, we at, at our peak, we had 13. Now there were people who work from home. We yeah. have a vibrant development team of, uh, of five or six. And then we have an operations team, a support team, basically just to you know, handle merchant inquiries and, and the like. And then we have people who work remotely, contractors from time to time as well. Right, right. Um, I think I also have one more probably question that I might have missed is can crypto 
like or I think weaken the national money of two countries? Is it been answered? I'm not sure. Um, I don't know if it can and uh, weaken the uh, the currency. Uh, but I do acknowledge that uh, you know there are countries who are looking to use, for example, Bitcoin as their main currency. Uh, I mean, you don't have to look far. Look at look at Argentina. In Argentina, people are now trying to use USDT because their money is worth less and less every single day. So, the classic use of cryptocurrency to replace, unofficially, of course, their main currency. So, I don't know if it'll weaken. It, I don't know if they're competing for the same thing, though. You have to remember, currency is something the banks use, whereas with cryptocurrency, it's all about being self-custodial and I am the master of my own money. You can't tell me where I need to, what, what I need to do with it. No one can stop you from spending your crypto, whereas a bank can call you and be like, nope, we don't like you spending your money there. You're not doing it. Right. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. that's okay. And even in terms of like, in terms of the global economy, in terms of this technology coming in play, like, what do you think? Like, do you think that the countries like, you know, the currencies that uh, jump into embracing it will be uh, like in a highly valued in a, in a kind of a different sense or like, um, how is it going to play out in the, in the well, this is going to be a hot take, but a lot of countries are going with what they call the CBDC, a central bank digital currency. I am personally not a huge fan of those. I feel like that's them taking cryptocurrency and turning into their current current financial system. Yeah, Only yeah. They'll, they, they'll pretend that it's like the CBDC is just like the normal dollar, but now a digital version. So they can do whatever they want. They can track users, whatever they want to. So I'm not a huge fan of CBDCs, but at the same time, I can see uh, for example, El Sal uh, was it El Salvador who made Bitcoin? The yeah, yeah, they, Dave has mentioned that I have made. Oh, a so, yeah, yeah. thank you, thank you, Dave. They were ridiculed when when Bitcoin was down in the bear market. They were ridiculed. Well, mm -hmm. surprise, surprise, it's it's coming back up. And if it if it doubles or triples in size, suddenly everyone will be sitting up and looking and going, "Hey, you did it, and it's working for you." We'll we'll have to wait and find out. Unfortunately, if if I had a crystal ball, it'd be great, but we'll have to wait and find out. And possibly final question, uh, um, like from Stephanie, what IT skills are required to join a team like your domain? Like even thinking of your journey from all the way from flight to here, like what is that gap that we're thinking of the new generation of like, you know, uh, skills and businesses to upskill? Another hot take I'm going to share with you today. Um, I believe uh, for IT skills, you need to have the, the mindset, the problem solving mindset. These days, there are tools like ChatGPT, Google Gemini, uh, even JetBrains AI tool. They all of these IDEs and they they're making programmers in a way obsolete, but in a way not at the same time. They're not there yet. But if you have the right mindset that I this is a problem and I want to solve it, you can just do it these days. That's download an app. Download the app. Go go to that. Um, um, you know. Chat GPT and try and try a couple of problems and see what yeah. happens. That's what I recommend to everyone. If you want to start doing it, do it. Don't mm -hmm. worry about, oh, is this security vulnerability? blah Because you're not going to be running a multi-billion dollar company just like that. By the time you get there, you'll be much more in a better space. Because remember, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have a programmer's degree. All I have is when I was in my dorm room and I was learning how to code and we're like, what does this do? I'm going to Google that. What does this do? And Google that. Yeah. And then learn from the base up. That That's exactly what anyone can do. It's just the attitude. Have a problem, solve it. Yeah. Thank you. I'm on the same page as well. I believe in a hands-on experience, a hands-on mm -hmm. and certificates and things that mm -hmm. you do something. But uh, I'm going to conclude with a quote from McAfee, which Ham has posted. Uh, from financial freedom comes all other freedom. Thank you for that, Ham. I think uh, that is a great way to conclude our career. Yeah. For today. And it means pleasure having you, Jit, and to share your journey and all the questions. Like, you know, patiently also appreciate you for giving more time for the Q&A, which mm -hmm. is fantastic. So I am going to um, let you go. And if somebody has any questions, please feel free to send it to him uh, in LinkedIn, reach out to him, and he's more he'll be more than clean, keen to um, take over and help you out with your journey, whatever that is. Definitely. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.
And we are on to the final concluding moments. Thank you all for being here. I think this is one of the very, like, you know, uh, amazingly received uh, um, um, received uh, lunchtime presentation. And one thing that I always say is if you always, if you have someone in your circle that is particularly interested in hosting some of these, like, you know, knowledge heavy and te technical heavy stuff, please, re please reach out to us. We are looking for these, like, you know, ideas and like, you know, um, on entrepreneurs and developers and things that to, to be part of this. Uh, please do come and uh, uh, please do send it to us, send it our way. And Jen, if you can put the last slide and make sure you sign up for the uh, March exhibit, March thing, because we're having a big, big, big book launch of sorts, sign up to our newsletter because it's one of the most amazing curation of everything that is happening in Canterbury Tech uh, and general technology in Waitangi region. Please, that will give you all the information that you need to capture the essence of it. But other than that, and also we are open, we are opening up our Tech Fest and Tech Summit um, tickets soon. So if you want to be part of a larger career focused on this, keep sure you uh, also look into a website and things. But other than that, I think I am particularly done. Um, am I missing something? No, Jen. Great. F fantastic. I'm going to let you all go. Thank you for joining and have a fantastic um, lunch and evening ahead and afternoon, probably. Uh, and see you later. Cheers. Bye-bye. Jit, I'll have you.